Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, on behalf of all the South African delegates um, presented here, um, we are six um, for your information, and collectively we represent about 43 of open access journals in South Africa. We'd really like to thank um, Cela Brazil for making it possible for all of us to actually attend this particular meeting. It's highly appreciated, and um, we're really enjoying it and learning quite a lot as we go along. I was asked to talk about open access journals in Africa. So Africa is much wider than just South Africa, and it poses actually a lot of um, challenges in terms of development in all these countries collectively as a whole. So to address it, I thought it would be best to just to step back for a moment and just look at institutional repository development in Africa. As you can see according to this um, maps, raw map, you can see that institutional repository development in Africa is very low and few and scattered in comparison with Europe, North America, and even South America. That is very indicative of open access journal development in Africa as a whole. And the reason for that is because of the absence of science policies, funding, etc., within the particular countries. If we have a look at the countries where institutional repositories have been developed, it's countries like South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Nairobi, um, Egypt, Nigeria, and that shows you where one can actually expect open access journals to develop and the understanding of open access as a whole. I wanted to focus on institutional repositories just for a moment, and the reason being that that was a very good learning curve for institutions embarking on open access as a whole. It certainly taught us about quality, because now suddenly putting your master's and doctoral thesis out there, a lot of questions were raised about, but is it of particular quality? It made us aware that because it's visible and accessible and open to the rest of the world to see, one has to pay attention about quality. It also made us realize the power of the internet in terms of visibility, indexability, and accessibility. It also challenged us in terms of infrastructural terms. Suddenly there were servers, bandwidth, software. We had to build up capacity and expertise. And institutions started to ask the question, well, who's going to pay for all of this if we post all these things on the servers? Who's going to support this? It's open source software. Um, what are we going to do with this? It was like a new animal and creature arriving in Africa almost. And then suddenly we were faced with paper copies. And if you want to be out there, it's got to be digitalized. And now suddenly we had to embark on huge projects and processes to actually digitize all these paper copies that we had around. And of course, the journey on open access advocacy started. And that was the beginning of open access journals, not only in South Africa, but for Africa as well. So it really taught us a lot. I think the biggest challenge for all journals and all research in Africa is the low visibility, accessibility, and indexability of scholarly research. Just to give you specifics, Africa and the Middle East journals indexed in the web of science only compromises 1% of the journals in the web of science. It's extremely low, so the impact thereof is almost zero. And that was a big concern, considering that in South Africa alone, we published 300 journals. Also in the report which Professor Crew reported back, there was an astonishing statistic that revealed how desperately and how urgently we had to pay attention to locally published journals and what we have to do about them, namely, that papers published in 60 South African journals did not receive a single citation in any of the 9,000 Web of Science journals over a 15-year period. And that really brought us to a standstill and realized that we are maintaining 300 journals and it feeds a particular system with funding to higher education institutions in the country. And it tainted the whole system in terms of funding to higher education institutions. 
But what we also found is that the local high-quality journals did not necessarily appear in the journals of the world, or in the rest of the world. And in order to gain global recognition, we had to do something about it, and we need to promote indigenous knowledge. So what are the challenges further in South Africa for journals? This report also revealed that research publishing in South Africa is undertaken in good faith and with much personal effort and commitment by the editors and the editorial boards. But the system was extremely fragile in the fact that journals were infrequent, thin, with a low supply of very good quality papers, and the majority of the journals only played a tiny role in the world research publishing system, and there was this mixed bag of quality which really tainted our system in the eyes of the world as such. Going in a little bit further, then where does it leave Africa? It's very difficult to actually state what Africa is experiencing at the moment because there haven't been really particular studies. But I'm very pleased to announce that the Carnegie Corporation has just funded Clowbridge Consulting in collaboration with African Journals Online to look at this particular situation. What is the state of scholarly publishing throughout Africa? So maybe more authoritative we would be able to say after this particular study, what is it that Africa journals actually experience? But in our formal tradings with authors and with editors across Africa, the problems are very much the same that have been discussed over the last few days within this particular group. So these problems are actually universal to all of us. And how are we going to take them forward? That remains the actual question. It's all about expertise levels, infrastructure, financial sustainability. And to add to the language discussion that took place in this room over the last few days, we publish mainly in English in South Africa, but we've got an indigenous language, Afrikaans, and we publish in Afrikaans as well. And it's already on the CLO South Africa platform. So already in your network, you've got Afrikaans language journals, let alone all the other indigenous journals in Africa and South Africa. And I want to add another dimension. We also have French-speaking countries in South Africa. So we'll add French to this group as well. So the debate will deepen as we go forward. And then, of course, the lack of training, intellectual property rights. But the point that I want to stop at, because this is really a challenge for authors in the developing world, and especially in South Africa, I want to focus on the World Bank classification. Africa is classified as a low per capita income, and it gets exempted from most of the author pay fees that publishers raises, except South Africa. South Africa is classified as a medium per capita income country, and some publishers actually think we don't reach out there, and we actually find that there's no mercy for South African authors as such paying article processing charges. So how does it get paid? As said, north of our borders, it doesn't get paid. There isn't monies in the system to actually recoup these costs. There isn't. In South Africa, it's slightly different because of our uh, position. We pay these fees from our, uh, from the, well, the authors pay these fees from their own research or from traditional central publication support funds. University of Stellenbosch, one of the largest um, research institutions in South Africa, has actually established an article processing charge fund, which authors can actually apply to and receive funds to publish in open access journals. So then what does it cost? For local open access journals, it's very low. Even for South Africans, it's comparatively very low. It's anything between 100 real and 250 real which is comparatively um, quite affordable. But if we compare it with international IPCs, it becomes impossible. Because the IPCs are anything between $1,350 and $5,000. This sometimes equals the research funds that researchers get to conduct the research within a particular year, depending on which, uni which university you are working. So it is an impossible situation as it currently stands. 
So what is our concern as Africa and South Africa, particular with these IPCs? It's clear that IPCs could eventually replace subscriptions in a systemic commercial gold root publishing system. And we're very worried about that. That it will be still be hyperinflationary. And that this new version of bundled institutional membership of fees is quite problematic as well. And that would place further barriers to publishing opportunities for developing countries. And the same hallmarks of monopolistic practice as characterized the previous system will still prevail. I want to focus now a little bit more inward towards South Africa. Uh, we have two fairly large commercial open access publishers, of which you met Professor Janet Sachi, who is heading up um, HMPG, which represents mainly health and medical journals in South Africa. There's 14 titles in that particular stable. Another open access publisher in South Africa is IOSIS, which is more multidisciplinary. And there's 25 titles in that particular um, stable. And what is our relationship in terms of CLA South Africa and these two open access publishers? I think that's the one thing that open access really created is an openness towards each other, how we share, how we compare, how we harvest each other's websites for information and populating the CLO South Africa platform. It has leveled the playing ground amongst all of us and the support that we give each other, I think, and the motivation has been incredible. I want to focus a little bit on African Journals Online. This is the only platform that has Journals of Africa loaded onto this particular platform. This platform is driven by open journal systems, as you can see by the screenshot right there. It's very familiar if you use OJS. It provides authors and journals in Africa a platform to publish their journals electronically. So they support them in terms of advice, guidance, training, how they should go about, but still they are mainly um, print-based. The problem of this particular platform is that there's almost 450 journals on it um, currently, but only 130 are open access. And the reason for that is that African journals cannot move over to an article processing charge model because of the reasons that I've mentioned. They cling to the paper subscriptions. Subscriptions are small and minute and gives little income, but if that little income is taken away, it will actually mean that journals in Africa could be destroyed as, uh, as such. So that's why this particular model. I want to focus a little bit on CLO South Africa. We're very new to the network. As you've heard, we were um, um, credited um, within this particular year. And it's amazing to actually be part of this particular network. It has really brought the current journals on this platform to a high level that I cannot actually describe in a matter of a few months and has really made us visible and accessible beyond what we actually imagined it would take us in a few months. Currently, and I'm always pleased to announce this, we are 30 journals strong. We will be adding five more journals before the end of December, another five by March 2014. That will mean that we have added 17 journals within this, our particular financial year. We've been very slow by adding journals up to now, and the reason being is because of the mechanism that feeds the platform in terms of quality control has been exceptionally slow up to now. But we're publishing four peer review reports, humanities, through, um, religious studies, medicine and health, and um, law, humanities, <laughs> I must think quickly. Let me not waste time. And that brings about a new wave of journals that we can add to the um, platform. So we're very pleased to see the growth and how it goes. I think this makes us tick. This makes us believe that we're doing the right thing in South Africa. If you look at the actual downloads per year, where it started in 2011, that's a red bar at the bottom. And where we, in the beginning of 2013, was still a very small collection where it just started and kicked off and how it's escalating. And when my staff really gets despondent and wondering why we're doing it and why I'm breathing down the neck and say, hurry up, we've got to publish more, we look at that. And it's getting bluer and bluer across the globe. 
And what is so magnificent is even how it infiltrates Africa, despite of the interconnectivity problems that we have. So this keeps us alive and makes us believe. And this is the first time in the history of South African journals that we can actually see how being utilized, etc., etc. I think this particular table gives us a complete different dimension to what is possible in this particular network. It shows us now being certified who of Brazil or in, in the um, Latin American um, context is citing South African authors and using their journals. What we haven't established yet, how many South Africans are actually using literature from the particular network so we've got lots of work to do is to analyze these statistics and understand the impact, the value, and the accessibility of all these journals. But the journey has been great and it's taking us to a lot of new um, heights. There are plenty of benefits of which are all aware in participating in this network. In the past, we didn't have much interest in CLO in South Africa, and just suddenly, after we've been certified, and after we've now been included in the Web of Knowledge platform, that has been the biggest carrot for journals in South Africa. And journals moving from commercial publishers now asking, well, what can we do to actually become an open access publisher? So the process has been slow, but it's certainly escalating to new heights. So what is the challenges within the African science system? The science system is less developed north from our borders. It is very lowly funded. The technical change in Africa is slow and very low. In a sense, I'm very disappointed in higher education institutions in Africa. They should be in the forefront of ensuring Africa's participation in ICT and knowledge production, and they're not. There's a lethargicness of all the reasons I've explained as to just giving that one large leap into the world of the internet and what it brings about. There's immense potential in open source software and open access for Africa as a whole, but it hasn't been fully utilized or grasped and rolled out within Africa. So who have been the role players so far in open access in Africa? There are many projects that's doing excellent and good work. NISAC, which is the network of African science academies, has just started to put their feelers out and trying to promote open access on a much higher level. The African Academy of Sciences have done some work. ICSU, the regional office for Africa, is starting to create some awareness amongst Africans. INAPS and I4, which are library consortiums, which works in Africa, has done tremendous work in terms of training and advocacy for open access. Library professionals, publishers, who've tried their best in this regard. This is just to name a few. I'm wrapping up my time keep it down here, um, I'm almost done. So what is lacking? Why are we not taking this big leap in terms of open access and the advantages it can bring? The coordination between these multitude of small scale, often very energetic and creative pilot initiative, pockets of innovation is lacking. It's very decentralized and it's not pulled together to make the impact. This leads actually to the underfunding of economies of scale, because economies of scale has not been reached as such. But the good news is, there is a slight awareness and the emergence of continent-wide strategies. So I think it's time that we harvest and connect between these initiatives. I want to make a case for science academies, because I think we're in a very strong position to take this forward. And the reason being, that we have a unique competitive advantage in influencing policies in the different countries. We have the potential to bring the top researchers of Africa together, policy makers, and to advocate open access and to take it on that particular level forward. The African Union is currently revising the plan of action, and in this plan of action, it states that it needs to build capacity knowledge production, technological innovation, and we should capitalize on this movement and the sentiment being expressed by much higher levels to take this particularly forward. That brings me to the end of my um, presentation. 
I want to thank you um, again for this opportunity, and I hope this has provided you with a general overview of open access in Africa. Thank you.